Hi everyone, welcome to part two of the lecture covering solidification. During the last lecture, I described many phenomena which are prevalent under equilibrium conditions for pure metals. In this part, I'll discuss what happens with alloys along with non-equilibrium conditions as it is largely the case for the real world. Let's first start with the rate at which alloys solidify. I have plotted both a binary phase diagram and cooling curves that are typical of each of the freezing ranges presented. The temperature marking the start of solidification for an intermediate composition, i.e. one that's not a pure metal, is identified by T0 and the end by T1. Moving from left to right across the phase diagram, one has a cooling curve which is typical of the pure metal with the lower melting temperature at one extreme and the higher melting temperature at the other. Under equilibrium conditions, the start of solidification occurs at some intermediate temperature and ends at another, as identified by the liquidus and solidus. So there is clearly a compositional effect on the cooling rates for a given rate of heat removal from one of these systems. There's a second complication in that there is no such thing as a constant rate of heat removal in an industrial solidification process. This is an image of an investment casting which has just been filled or charged with liquid metal. The metal will solidify first at a point A near the surface, and there will be far more heat readily transferred to the environment here as opposed to point B at the center of the casting. Therefore, the temperature will stay higher at the center far longer than on the outside, or the cooling rate at point A will far exceed point B. The juxtaposition of these two factors can create some wild departures from equilibrium conditions. First, extreme temperature gradients, which in turn aggravates the compositional effects on cooling rates. How can these affect the underlying microstructure? Well, let's start first with our trusty phase diagram and have a look at what happens underneath slightly non-equilibrium conditions. Here's the copper-nickel system again. But this time we've changed the cooling rate to proceed slightly faster than equilibrium. Nucleation occurs as before with some enriched alpha. As we proceed with our solidification, our alpha evolves to maintain this enriched core of nickel, surrounded by a region with slightly less nickel, but still more than what would be found for equilibrium conditions. Note that the morphology does not assume a discretized form like I've drawn here but a smooth continuous function of decreasing nickel from the center to the outside of each grain. This carries on until the material is completely solidified, but the next thing to note is that the freezing point has decreased as well. This shift in distribution of nickel across the solidifying grains has shifted the equilibrium solidus down as the local compositional changes affects the Gibbs free energy. The reason for this change in solidus is that the diffusion rates are too slow to prevent segregation or trapping of nickel in the centers of the grain during initial solidification. In order for equilibrium, one has to afford as much time as required to achieve steady state and permit all forms of local transport of heat and mass to go to completion. Let's examine further what happens at the solidification front. What I've done here is draw the solidification process occurring in two dimensions. Here, the black line represents a site for heterogeneous nucleation, such as a mold wall or a component being welded. The arrow indicates heat flow from the melt through anything that gets solidified and finally out of the region. Early on in the solidification process, the effects of segregation are fairly inconspicuous, as the distance for diffusive transport is short and thermal gradients are not pronounced. As the solidification front advances, upwards in this instance, segregation effects become more significantly distinct, particularly as the thermal gradient across the domain increases, that is, from the solidification front back to the mold, and the time required for diffusion diminishes. Therefore, species that segregated earlier have little opportunity to normalize. What I've done here is now superimpose an idealized crystalline growth mechanism on top of the solidification front. As in part one, these blue squares represent cubic unit cells. These still have to adhere to the principles of the critical size in order to assure growth, but there is another complicating factor. Directions which are aligned with specific crystallographic orientations are favored by the directionality of heat flow. 
Following this to the end of solidification, we have a lot of segregated grains, but also some grains which are far larger than others due to their orientation. Note that the blue grains are still segregated, but they have grown to a much larger extent than those which are oriented farther away from the principal direction of heat transfer. Recalling the Miller notation for crystallographic orientation described in the crystal structure lecture, the grains which had their crystallographic directions aligned with the 100 direction were favored for growth. What I've described here is directional solidification with the combined effects of segregation on top of crystal growth. These are mutually exclusive as both would occur even in pure metals. If there was no appreciable directionality with respect to heat transfer, then this type of solidification front would still occur, albeit in a random orientation to generate the equiaxed grains described in part one. Directional solidification generates columnar grains as depicted here. Directional solidification along with segregation gives rise to further development of texture and resulting anisotropy. Moving away from a 2D representation of a solidification front, we're ready to describe these mechanisms occurring in three dimensions. When undercooling is applied, many metallic systems will respond with the formation of dendrites. While nucleation and initial solidification will generate early grains as spheres, because there is preferred crystallographic orientation, at longer length scales, a dendritic microstructure will form. These appear as trees if they're columnar, or globular clouds if equiaxed. The trunks of the trees are primary arms, and from these extend secondary or even tertiary dendrite arms. The spacing between the secondary arms, shown here as lambda, can be correlated directly to cooling rates. What I've shown here on the right is what a random cross-section of a dendritic grain looks like for a cast aluminium alloy. Again, it's important to highlight that this goes on in three dimensions, even for pure metals, as depicted here for a dendritic cell made from pure copper. The intervening space between the dendritic structure is usually filled in with a secondary phase that forms. In the case of the cast aluminium alloy, it can be considered a binary eutectic system of aluminium and silicon. The dendrites are a primary aluminium-rich phase, and the interdendritic region is populated by a silicon-rich phase. Predicting the length scale of dendritic microstructure is non-trivial. As you can see, the secondary arm spacing of the aluminium alloy is 40 micron, while the scale bar for the inset copper micrograph is 10 microns. We'll discuss microstructure morphology further in subsequent lectures, but what we have is what we need to examine a typical cast ingot microstructure. To the right is an aluminium ingot, which has been sectioned and etched to show the underlying grains. Here we can see fine grains located at the walls where the initial cooling rate was the highest. Moving towards the center, the next region which solidified has a columnar arrangement as the solidification rate is slowed. Directionality prevails here as the mold wall has become somewhat insulated by the initial grains which have solidified. The columnar grains grow with their orientations favoring the 100 directions until the heat transfer rate decreases and equiax conditions prevail. In terms of segregation, the central portion of the ingot will be the last to solidify and will stay the hottest for the longest amount of time, but this will have a heavily enriched composition of alloying ingredients not incorporated earlier. In the case of our copper nickel system, there would be far more copper in this liquid than there would be nickel. This additional enrichment can further spur dendritic growth. Now let's have a look at a dendritic solidification event and the structure that it produces as it occurs. What we have here is the high-speed radiography of the solidification of an aluminium copper alloy. This video is generated by a large number of radiographs taken with high power x-rays. Copper is much denser than aluminium, so in these equiax dendrites we can also see the relative segregation occurring within the dendritic structure as it forms. Bright regions are aluminium rich and darker regions are copper rich. Furthermore, even though they are equiaxed, as they grow they elongate in one direction 
which coincides with a solidification sequence, top to bottom. So we know which direction heat was extracted from this experiment. So there you have it. Solidification is a fairly complicated process, but we've worked our way through it systematically. We've covered the phenomena of segregation and just witnessed it occur in a dendritic microstructure, which most cast metals exhibit. Segregation and directional solidification can have a big impact on how uniform the properties are throughout a material, imparting greater anisotropy. There are routes to reversing or eliminating these often deleterious effects, which we'll cover when we discuss heat treatments. Until next time.